Welcome back. You're watching our special edition of NTV tonight on this a day of the big breaking news coming from State House Nairobi. On a day, President William Ruto sacked his entire cabinet. All the cabinet secretaries, with the exception of the prime cabinet secretary, that is Musalia Mudavadi. Uh, we have been getting reactions from every corner of this republic and joining us in studio to just try and help us understand the events, seemingly historic events of today, is uh, Advocate for Good Governance and Accountability, Wanjiro Gikonyo, Philip Kissia, Governance and Leadership Expert, as well as Lawyer and Political and Governance Analyst, Martin Olo. Lady and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Martin, if I can begin with you, did you expect this? And can you pinpoint at what exact moment the spark came to life? The point at which I expected the president to be radical was about four weeks ago. The first time he realized that the tide had turned, this is the action he should have taken in the first instance. He should have said, I have failed, I have been failed, and therefore I am rebooting. So this was the first action. So to have come at this moment, it is okay. Our issue now, or my issue now is, even as it comes, how is he navigating it? I saw the prefacing of it, mm -hmm. and then I saw the action, and then I saw the statements. What the president needs to understand is that in leadership and in development, there is such a thing as called the unwanted results. You might get good results. For example, when he talks about uh, Hustler Fund, when he talks about, those are results as far as it's concerned, but are they the wanted results? When he talks about the housing levy and a few things, are those the wanted results? In other words, is he in sync with people and people's expectations? There's a messaging that he has done today, which is that I want to consult broadly. I want to do it in public and in private. And I believe that even now, he, we, we are giving him some free consultation now. We are telling him that Kenyans are speaking around governance issues. They are asking you the question that, how, how come we have corruption? How come we have no accountability? How come we have wasted your public resources? Those are the big questions. So as he consults, as he tries now to reorganize government, let him just address the fundamentals. These guys aren't, uh, even as they said, suck incompetence and whatnot. Yes. They were looking at the effects and the results of that incompetence. So you take them away, but what are you doing about corruption? What are you doing about public service? Because public service is being available for people. Not being arrogant, not being a lord, not being a boss. Yeah. So there are things that he will have to deal with, both at his level and entire government apparatus. So that even when members of parliament are on one end, the executive are on the other, Kenyans are asking of humility, they are asking of their leaders to be available, to be emotionally intelligent, right. and to feel them. Asking the right questions. Um, Wanjiro, the Gen Z have seemingly um, transformed the civil society space. I mean, we've seen how fast they've uh, organized some of those protests and how um, efficient they have been. How, could, how would you describe the build-up to this moment? Right. Uh, Kitili, thanks. And, and uh, just looking at the statement, the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Foreign and Diaspora Affairs was also retained. So that those are the two positions that uh, were retained. I yes. imagine to help the president keep uh, a handle on the helm. And, and uh, I think, you know, agreeing with Martin that uh, Kenyans need to see more certainty yeah. from the president. These, um, this is feeling very sporadic. And uh, we hope to see more structure. So what's the build up? You know, Kitil, you have to recall that the start of this um, was the first actions of the president go goes back to how these people got into office. Right. The cases that collapsed, um, and then people were appointed. Um, the DPP then was appointed to an even higher office. 
Uh, then the whole way the president has moved in getting um, MPs to cross, cross over informally, inviting them to state house, and they've you know, crossed into the party uh, really unofficially. Eh? Um, just the way the president has moved is, um, has undermined the independence of institutions. He's, he's, he's used some soft diplomacy, but also the old style tactics yeah. of trying to co-opt. Um, and in so doing, by surrounding himself with people who lack legitimacy and accountability, when corruption scandals have started in office, then he's, we are in an austerity program and we see a government with largesse and then they are refusing to pay interns. You have to remember medics were on, the, on strike um, for uh, I think it's up to two or three uh, months. Yes. Um, so this anger has been there. Then there's the housing levy. Then we are seeing changes with uh, the NHIF that we really don't understand. We've seen, um, you know, we had this huge corruption case of Aro Kimwarel. Then we see the case has, has folded. We know this money was stolen. We've been tracing it. Case f is folded. And that former uh, uh, cabinet secretary is then appointed. So uh, the president has, the outgoing president, because let's remember, the moment the finance bill collapsed, and now that he's fired the president, uh, the, the, his cabinet, the president is admitting he's got it wrong. And in fact, I would go as far as to say he's operating almost like a caretaker because he's lost the confidence of a majority of Kenyans. It's not just the Gen Zs. You believe he's not coming back from this? Um, he can't, you know, his previous actions that have brought him here, because we can say William Ruto brought this on himself because he ignored the constitution. He ignored the people. He was abrasive. He was... Um, maybe not arrogant in his words, but in his actions by forcing and saying housing levy is good for you. And yet there are so many questions that were being asked. Then when um, the Auditor General comes out and raises questions, you know, very methodically right. about these, pro these schemes that have been pushed through, at a time when there's a global economic crisis, there's a debt crisis, there's a fiscal crisis, uh, poverty has gone up because of COVID. You know, people are feeling the pain and government is living large. Um, so the poor projects, poorly implemented, poor choices, uh, leadership choices. Yes. Um, we thank the Gen Z. <coughs> they did what we couldn't do. I think we've been saying it. They have acted it and they have said enough is enough. Right. Uh, Mr. Kisia. We are seeing tonight, uh, the president has done something that we last saw in 2005 um, after the failed referendum. Um, cabinet only has the president, the deputy president, and uh, the prime CS, who's also the foreign affairs and diaspora CS, Musale Mudavadi. What drove this from where he sits? Um, well, Kitili, uh, thank you uh, for having me here today. I've not been here for quite some time. And uh, even before I make a few comments, uh, picking on what uh, wha wha my sister has said and uh, Martin has said, let me pass condolences to the families that have lost their loved ones. Uh, they are, I think, about 40, not about, I think, 41. And the numbers could even be more. Uh, now, where, how did the president find himself here? I think leadership just like my brother Martin has said, it's about listening to people. It's about um, uh, implementing a vision that is shared. But we have a president who believes that um, he's providing leadership to a population that has no idea of what they want. And therefore, he is there at the top and he knows and has all the solutions and therefore, he will force through whatever he wants down the throats of the people. Now, what the people have done uh, through the Gen Zs and the millennials, they have said, Mr. President, this is not what we want. We exactly know the direction that we'd want this country to take. And if you are not listening to us, then we shall find other means 
of getting you to listen. So the president has been forced into a corner. He's been forced to listen to the people who put him in office. Of course, some of um, our young kids, and I happen to be uh, a father for, of both uh, generations, some of them didn't vote in um, uh, 2022. Right. But this, I mean, they're now grown-ups. They, they, they will certainly uh, have a voice uh, come uh, 2027. I think the president had time, um, uh, you know, to take action. He delayed a little bit. And you see, for those who have done marketing, there's something that we call, uh, uh, you know, product life cycle. You have growth. You have birth, growth, and decline. Mm -hmm. So Ruto's and his advisors should have noticed that you are actually getting to the decline stage. And you know, when, when you want to save a product, you arrest it before it gets to decline. He failed to arrest the product before it got to the decline stage. We are now at decline, and I doubt whether any interventions will save his government. All right. As a matter of fact, as uh, Wanjiro has said, I think he's transiting. He, you know, he's only there for some time, buying time, but how much time can he buy? I think uh, if I were him, if I was advising the president, I would ask him to start preparing for exit. Mm -hmm. I think if he exits the stage now, we'll remember him for one or two things that he did mm. that we think probably benefited this country, but if he delays any further, then the exit will be untidy. All right. We'll, we'll talk about the political ramifications as well as uh, the youth uh, factor. But before we do that, I want us to talk about the cabinet itself, um, the, the, the key subject tonight. And uh, let's listen in to uh, the nominated member of parliament, John Badi, who's also the chairman of the ODM party. Um, speaking in Parliament during the vetting process of uh, President William Ruto's cabinet. Looking at this cabinet in totality, I have my fears we are approving, if we do approve, we are approving a cabinet that is not so competent. We are approving a cabinet that I think the mindset of the appointing authority was not on service delivery. This is not a cabinet that is going to bring economic revolution in this country. This is not a cabinet that is going to have Kenya take off from a middle income economy. This is a cabinet that lacks competence, integrity in many aspects. The president is simply telling us that we give him a cabinet that is not going to function because he's ready to run the entire government system, machinery, and structure from state house using advisors. All right, Martin, this yes. cabinet has been, um, we've seen controversy, we've seen integrity issues, reports of incompetence. There was uh, one of the cabinet secretaries during the, nom the vetting process was rejected by the vetting committee and was saved by the house. Um, we've seen display of opulence at a time Kenyans have been talking about um, um, bad economic times. What is your take on Ruto's cabinet? Is it right to say that this, is, this will be remembered as one of the most problematic cabinets? You know, I, I, I want to say this, that when I've just listened to what Mbadi has said, when you look at our constitutional architecture, this is not the cabinet that Kibaki had or our system is no longer the same as what Kibaki had and what Moi had. Or indeed, this is not the Westminster system where a cabinet is really a function of government. Ours is a presidential system clothed with a bit of uh, independent judiciary and legislature. But the government is not run by the cabinet as it were or as it was those days. So the presidency is really part of the cabinet. So when this cabinet is formed or when the president is choosing the people that want to assist him in the cabinet, it is not, the strength of the government is not in the cabinet. Mm -hmm. The strength of the government is in the presidency. And that's where the combination of the presidency and the deputy is this executive office. Now having said that, then 
the cabinet secretaries and as they were, they were supposed to be technical people in our current constitution. They were supposed to be technical people. Now that's where you begin to ask, so how technical is one cabinet secretary responsible for education? What is his technical capacity? How technical is one cabinet secretary responsible for agriculture? And you can go on and on and on and on. And therefore you begin to wonder, what a wasted opportunity. You need people who come to assist you to run the government because this is your presidency. So you bring in people who don't succeed. And then what do you do? You bring in a coterie of advisors who then work out of the state house and really who duplicate the cabinet. So you have a coterie of financial advisors, a coterie of economic advisors, essentially giving you uh, the kind of advice that you'd be expecting from uh, the treasury. Then you have a uh, former solicitor general sitting with you as a legal advisor, essentially uh, giving you legal uh, advice uh, away from the AG. So the way that this presidency organized the cabinet was not an inclusive cabinet, but it was an appendage. So that if you look at some of the people and the portfolio they were in, there was nothing useful they were going to tell you. And you saw it, one of the clips you just read, where he was haranguing them and telling them, some of you have no clue what's going in your ministries. Of course he was right. And they were never meant to have any clue because how do you pick somebody whose public record is not known? They're not known for anything. The academic uh, track record is questionable. They are telling you that they did an online course and you have no idea <coughs> how you can do a, medis, a, a medical uh, I mean, uh, course online and so on. So basically what we are saying is that there was no cabinet worth talking about. I'm not one of those guys who are celebrating that the cabinet has been dissolved. This cabinet was not fit in the first instance. But again, power was not resident there. Power was resident in the presidency. All right. What then we are now looking at is the presidency has questioned himself. The presidency has questioned itself. And this action is not going to now give him reprieve. Now you can see where people are. They say, hey, hey, we are now asking you more questions. Mm -hmm. Wanjiro, um, there are those who say the president shot himself in the foot, so to speak, by, uh, by rewarding his political cronies at the expense of appointing a brilliant you know, cabinet of technocrats. But what is your take on this cabinet by Ruto? Yeah, I think I agree very much with, uh, with Martin. Um, you know, even from the outset, there was always this question. You know, you bring into office what you have in terms of leadership. Um, and so this goes to um, who is William Ruto? What is his experience? Now, he's not a career civil servant. He's not like uh, Kibaki was. Kibaki had that advantage of understanding the public service and respecting the public service. And under his tenure, things ran much, uh, you know, a lot, a lot more smoothly. He was also an economist. So he made a few right calls that put the country on a, on a better footing. I mean, it wasn't, uh, we didn't get the transformation we needed. We didn't fight corruption. We didn't deal with all of that. But at least there were some basics. But since Jubilee time, there's been, you know, I, I think a discomfort with the civil service and a sense where um, the president works outside of the civil service. And this is actually mirrored also at the county level. And we've been weakening the public service. So on one hand, we've got a public service that um, really needs a lot of cleanup because we know there's a lot of corruption that takes place through the public service. But by the same token, you've got then a political class that isn't really um, making good use. So the president talked about institutionalizing politics. This was on his manifesto. So in his mind, his leadership style was exactly what he brought, and it hasn't worked. Not only that, um, he then made political promises that he has not been able to implement um, because he got the policy totally mixed up. So really, this is why William Ruto can't survive. Because much as he's fired the cabinet, it's his cabinet, he appointed them singularly. He's then singularly 
fired them, and it's not just the cabinet, there are other appointments that have been made that shouldn't see the light of day. People with no experience are being posted even outside the country. We've got also um, positions which maybe aren't direct postings, but they are accountable. For instance, when we're talking about the killings of uh, protesters, this year and last year, we are at a body count of maybe 110 when you uh, accumulate this. Yet the president has been on record uh, <coughs> lauding the, the, the police brutality against our youth when they protested over economic conditions. So um, this is why uh, the best we pray will happen is that uh, William Ruto has shown a vulnerability which the country needed. And that vulnerability is he has stepped down. He stepped down on the finance bill, he has stepped down on this. He now needs to embrace the reality that he has failed, but the country doesn't have to fail with him. And what he needs to give us, uh, because he's still the um, elected president, much as he's lost the public will, you know, in, in any other jurisdiction he would resign. He would say, I've lost the confidence of the people, I'll resign. It's a pre presidential system, you don't really have to do that, you can battle it out. But we need a clear path to his getting out. We don't want to have this, you know, as long as he's having these radical uh, one-off movements, he's then, it's hard to then hold him accountable, to quantifiable, predictable. So he needs to give us, transition requires a framework. This is what is going to happen because the demands have been put out. Those demands are far reaching beyond even William Ruto. Those, the demands that have been made are based on historical structural problems that we have. And so I agree so much with Kisia that the president has, the outgoing president, has an opportunity to serve the country, to actually work in the public good. And the last point I'll make is the body language of the president. The moment you appoint people who were implicated, charged, actually had running cases on corruption, and you then appoint them to the highest office, already you've sent a message that accountability really doesn't work. And there was a lot of double speak about, you know, in zero tolerance. But then we've seen people uh, implicated in uh, deals, and then the party comes in, the house comes in to save them. Um, like over the fertilizer issue just, you know, less than a month ago. So the fact that the president has failed on so many counts, he now has an opportunity to be vulnerable, to be humble, and to accept. He has really let the country down. He has betrayed even his own manifesto. But he has an opportunity to help the country deal with a lot of historical things and also deal with some of the mistakes he's made because economically there are some very poor decisions that have been made. The privatization and the, um, of uh, social services in this country without a proper discussion, without consideration of the impact on households mm -hmm. really is another aspect that has decampaigned uh, William Ruto. No, uh, yeah, Mr. Kisia, what is your take on on the Ruto cabinet, and uh, has the, 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 the CSS failed Ruto, or did he author his own downfall? The cabinet has not failed Ruto. Ruto failed himself, because you see, when you are a good manager, you get surrounded by people who will help you in delivering your promises or your manifesto. You have that authority, you have that chance. It has been given to you by the Constitution. So when you go and pick up mediocrity, you can't blame the person you picked up because that person did not find himself or herself in office. You put them there knowing very well that they did not have the competencies to manage that office. Now, if you look at the um, cabinet that uh, President uh, Ruto gave us of 22, maybe out of 22, the only ones that I can pick are probably six, seven, or eight who actually qualify in terms of experience, in terms of um, sound ed education, in terms of knowledge of running any uh, government institution. But the rest, which is about 70% of the cabinet, is a cabinet that was actually um, bound to fail. We saw it coming. 
he was told. But because President Ruto wanted to run a cabinet from his office, he appointed people who were extremely weak. And even those people he gave jobs who are competent, he gave jobs to people who he knew he can control. He gave jobs to people who he very well knew who cannot face him and tell him the truth and tell him, you know, Mr. President, I know you'd want me to do A, B, C, D, but I would suggest that we take a different route. So you, have a, uh, you, 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 know, you are surrounded by a cabinet of people who fear you. They don't even respect you, but they fear you. So they'll do anything to please the master. And this is what has happened. So I was not expecting any, um, you know, any, any better results than what we have seen. Uh, this is the best I've done. In fact, I've done very well. Because this is a cabinet, in my view, that should never have lasted even for six months. The fact that they have stayed in office for 18, 18 months is actually a miracle. You know? So, um, well, uh, I'm glad that uh, there has been pressure from uh, the citizens, uh, and which, which the pressure has awakened uh, the president. He has now dissolved uh, his cabinet. And, in, uh, I mean, he's basically saying that he has failed. Because it is not the cabinet which has failed. It is the president who has failed. And if you have failed, what are the chances that um, even if Kenya's decided to give him another chance, if they decide to give him another chance? Because what I'm hearing from uh, the people, they are saying, well, this is your cabinet. You have dissolved the cabinet. But the problem was not cabinet. The problem was you. What are the chances that Ruto will govern differently? Does he have the competencies, even if he was given a chance, does he have the competencies to provide good leadership for the next three years? I really doubt. Because even probably, even if he has, I think his character betrays him. The way he, you know, he believes in himself, he doesn't see solutions coming from other people. And that is now not how to run an institution. You run an institution by listening to people who are around you. And Kenya, I can tell you, the Republic of Kenya is blessed with very sound people running ministries. Right. If yeah. given a chance, the technocrats, if given a chance, they, they're, they're the same great. people we've had during Kibaki's time. They are the same people we had during Uhuru's time. They have never changed. What has changed are the policy makers. Right. So if there's failure, it is not at the techn uh, a technical level. It is actually at the policy level. Ben, I want, the to, connect. I want to connect something here. Yes, Martin. The biggest failure for this government around the cabinet revolves at two points. Do you know a lady called Masi Wanjau? Secretary She's to secretary the to the cabinet. Do you remember when Kenya ever had a secretary of the cabinet who was not also head of public service? Only in this government. Do you remember why Uhuru retained Kenya? Why Kibaki worked with Mudaura? And both of those were the secretary to the cabinet? Because the cabinet's decisions are implemented by technocrats. And then you take those decisions, when the head of public service is there, they are able to communicate those decisions to the various ministries. Now you bring in a lawyer, uh, and I'm one of them, uh, they are experiences in commercial arbitration and some governance and you make them secretary to the cabinet. Yeah, they'll take minutes very nicely, corporate governance is fine, but this is public service. So then what do you do to it? The second limb that is totally out of place. Mm -hmm. You bring an ex-politician and an ex-ambassador as the head of public service and chief of staff. What does that guy know about public service? What is in that experience about public service? Zero. Then you deputize him with a governor, former governor, uh, who has never run and has never been a public service. So if you want to fail, you design your cabinet in that manner, where the section of the cabinet is just a minute taker not somebody who can have who has authority over the, 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 the technocrats. Mm -hmm. And that's why what Philip is saying is correct. When you don't have a link to the technocrats, whatever you discuss, even as a government or as, as an executive in the cabinet, it remains there. It remains unimplementable. Right. So our, the weakness which, when he is rethinking his cabinet, 
you cannot have somebody who does not have public service experience as your secretary of the cabinet or the chief or the head of public service who is also not uh, the secretary of the cabinet because that is where the weak link is. Interesting. Now, I'll just talk up before we talk about the youth factor. Um, when you when uh, there was a presidential interview a couple of weeks ago where one of the things that came out of the interview and also looking at Kenyans uh, reading their tweets and posts on, on social media was that they do not trust the president. Um, that trust, how does Ruto build, rebuild, if, if, if I could say that, if it was ever there, trust with Kenyans? Um, I would, I'm not sure that's the question that we are going to be answering now. The, the question is not about Ruto, the question is about Kenya. Because the crisis we have is a president who has really, he lost the trust. It's not Kenyans who lost trust in him, it's his actions. And we've talked about them here. Uh, those actions from poor appointments, from even mismanagement, from, you know, uh, high-handedness, all of that. In my view, the most William Ruto can do is build trust in the process of his exit uh, from that office. Because um, how will he appoint a new cabinet? Um, that, you know, I think we've already canvassed that. So um, the question, and if you listen beyond the trust, the question that Kenyans are asking is how do we move from where we are to where we want to get. Because there's a raft of demands that have been made. This is not about William Ruto. It was never about William Ruto. That's the mistake he made. He, much as we're in a presidential system, the president shouldn't think that they're the savior of the country. That is not the kind of governance system we have. The president actually exists. He holds that office to serve the people and to be a leader that encourages, that shows an example so the cabinet can also serve the people. And the people need, this is actually a governance issue. The main demand is for accountability. That's a constitutional issue. You know, it's not, and that's why Gen Z even refused to meet with the president, because they said, what are we meeting to discuss? Mm. Do your job. Actually, we as civil society are also out of a job because we've spent many years trying yeah. to persuade politicians to do their job. Mm -hmm. And Gen Z have come and they have told them, do your job. So the question is not how does William Ruto build trust. It's not about him. It's bigger than him. The question is how do we ensure our country does not teeter off because it can teeter off if he doesn't manage this process. Transitions require clear goals clear communication, a clear roadmap. So the question he needs and the consultation he needs quickly is to put that in place. Right. But he needs to read the writing because he's misread it all along. His time is up. And whether it's in the next three months, six months, 12 months, I don't know if he'll make it to the, the election post. It depends on this framework. His time is up. And the only service, in my view, I mean, there are people who are saying William Ruto must go immediately. In fact, the Ruto must go hashtag. But then you're saying, in reality, we don't want to destabilize the country over a failed presidency because this is a failed government. We want to stabilize the country, and there's an opportunity he has to, you know, do that service for the country by putting a good framework right. that allows us to move over and implement the, the list of demands because that is actually tougher. It's easy to fire a cabinet, it's probably easy to hire a cabinet, but how do you clean out a lot of uh, six, 60 years? Right. Mm. Martin, can the president come back from this? He can. The question is how? He can. But I have not written him off. I know that we are calling him past or transition. I have not written him off. He's still in office. The problem we have, and again, is a constitutional problem. This is not the previous constitution where the president would dissolve parliament, call for elections. This constitution has automatic mechanisms within parliament itself for its parliament to dissolve when the time comes to 
uh, expiration. What we don't have is an expectation of, or rather we never anticipated where we are today, so that our constitution does not have a, a, a provision for what should happen where, when people have lost confidence in government. Macron in France had to call for elections because he saw where he was going. Rushi Sunak had to call for elections because the, 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 the conservatives saw where the mood was going and for sure the walloping that they got even for Macron in, in, in France was obvious. This was reflective of where the mood is. We don't have that kind of a constitution in this country. So can the president come out of it? Absolutely. But he has to come out of it with some sense of self-awareness. He needs now to realize where he, how he got where he got. He needs to accept that he has made some mistakes. Mm -hmm. I have, when I look at him, I don't seem to see him having any admissions. He says, I have considered. Then he goes on to say things that show that he's regretting. So he needs to concede. And only when he has conceded can he make the right steps. And I want to say this on this, on this um, set. He cannot go back to Raila and the, oh, the tired and bitter route to reinvent himself. He's missing it. He's missing it. And when he met with Baba down the KICC, the barrage, the vitriol that came out of the youth and others, because you can't go back. And by the way, when they say, uh, you know, when Baba is going to meet with him, it's true. Because Baba doesn't understand where the revolution is coming from and that he's not part of it. He cannot understand that there can be a demonstration in this country mm. without him. Not Baba. This one has happened in spite of and without him. And they have told him, where can you ban him? There's something you said earlier about trust. And please, I want to say this, and I, and you, I agree with you, that it's not about Ruto. It's not even about the presidency. It's about authority. The young people have questioned authority not just at the executive, right. they have questioned it even in church and the religious spheres, and they have questioned it at parental level. I'm so happy that Philip is here with his son to listen to us, because these young people are looking through us, and they have told us that we seem to be having a problem. In fact, if there's anything we must have learned out of this is, the young people looked at us, had our arguments, and they never told us they were going on the street. The following day, they simply went on the streets. And they took selfies from there telling us where they were. They were reporting themselves after. So there is a place of renaissance. We have to renew ourselves as parents, as people with authority, as religious leaders, as government, as the legislature, as the judiciary. So this discussion isn't ending where the public cabinet is being dissolved, right. Kenya is changing. And the young people are questioning the basis upon which decisions are made and upon which we, we cite our authority. Right. They have challenged it. Mr. Kisia, what is your take on this? Well, le let me comment on the two issues. One, the, the issue of uh, having a trust deficit and whether uh, President Ruto can come out of it. I think President Ruto should count himself lucky because um, he was given a second chance. We have known his history. Some of us have been with him for some time. We've known probably he has not been very truthful all along the line from the time he entered into the political space. The second chance was given when he was elected, when he was given the opportunity to be the president of the Republic of Kenya. That was trust that was bestowed upon him by the people of Kenya. Mm. He has abused that trust. So to answer your question, can Kenyans trust him a third time, I doubt. Then there's the issue of um, whether um, there is um, a possibility of him getting out of this situation. Martin is a lawyer. And I know there, there was an opinion that was given by Emeritus Justice Maraga uh, based on this issue of gender. Uh, I think it was Article, it's article 261, mm -hmm. subsection 7, something like that, mm -hmm. which said that, uh, you know, now that this parliament is not properly constituted, it should be dissolved. I think using that judgment, if I were him, if I want to go home in peace with my head up, I'll use that provision, I'll use that advice that was given by Emeritus Justice Maraga mm -hmm. 
to send this parliament home because it is not properly constituted. It is operating illegally. It is operating with, without, uh, not within the, the, the confines of our constitution. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, probably... Mm. In fact, um, unfortunately, but, that option, but, he doesn't have it. it what, the president okay. cannot dissolve yeah. parliament. No, I'm he saying can't. it was given by uh, Maraga. And that's why no action. What was it? Maraga, was, Maraga uh, I thought Maraga cited uh, uh, 261. Yeah, but the automatism of it is that the, 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 the parliament itself yeah. has to come to that realization and dissolve. But so, for but now, the president... Not even if it is properly constituted. Who, so who dissolve, dissolve That's a what parliament? That's what I'm saying. Our architecture... Who will, who will dissolve a parliament yeah. that is not properly constituted? Our architecture needs to be... Where do we go to? Is it no longer... No Where longer, do we go to? It's no longer available. If the court yeah. had given that directive, yeah. perhaps it is, would have been so, but it gave an advisory. So it remained one. So, you know, the, the point now, is this then, conversation... The, that's the last one. I think the other issue that uh, um, my brother Martin brought about, uh, about uh, Baba, I think the Gen Zs have been very patient with him. Yeah. And they have given him very sound advice. They have respected him and they asked him to, to stay off this space because he has done his bit. Mm -hmm. And I, my advice would have been to uh, Baba, who I really have a lot of regard and respect to, for, for, is that he cannot play Jesus all the time. He came in to save Mwai Kibaki when we had political turmoil. He came, stepped in to save uh, President um, uh, uh, Uhuru's presidency. He did it very well. He cannot do it a third time. And this time, we have a, genera a generational um, uh, uh, revolution. Mm. It is a new generation that we are dealing, dealing with. So he's not dealing with uh, the silent generation and the boomers who would respect the, uh, the, the elderly, who would respect the authority. You are dealing with a generation that is asking hard questions and what they are, want are answers and nothing else. Speaking of which, uh, Mr. Kise, bring us to, let's talk about the youth. Uh, and Wanjiro, I want to begin with you. We've had many so-called revolutions and protests uh, from the fight for multipartism in the, in the early 90s. Uh, to all protests, even the 2018 um, Machozi Mondays, we have never seen anything like what we have over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've never seen parliament breached. Um, what, what is the difference with this generation, in your opinion? Yeah. So first of all, on this parliament breached, parliament is the house of representatives. I think we lost, began to lose it with parliament when they put barricades on the road out of parliament. It already has a double fence, you know. So our legislators are so afraid of the, their, of their, of the people they represent that they barricade themselves. Um, and then the, the shooting of uh, protesters. You know, I don't support um, the use of uh, any sort of vandalism. Um, but the killing of young protesters was excessive use of force. They should have been arrested, taken through the procedure for breaking, entering, and whatever. So the idea that um, we, we use the term breached as though this is a secure facility that the public are not supposed to be, really means we've lost the plot. And I, Gen Z are actually on accountability. It's a reset of saying we are the people. And that's their campaign because our political leaders forgot. It. They thought it's about themselves, about flying here, you know, doing selfies in, from Dubai or their airlines or showing us how many watches and everything they have. We have really um, descended to such a, our public culture has really denigrated um, any sense of public good or even dignity of office. So don't use the term parliament was breached. Parliament actually belongs to the people, not the other way around. Um, but the question, uh, I even forgot your question. The youth. Yes. The youth. Ah, what yes, we haven't seen this. Um, yes, we are pleasant. Uh, let me just use a, maybe an anecdote. Um, I know so many people my age, Gen Zs, uh, and they are also baby boomers, who don't watch news, who barely read the newspaper. These are professionals. Um, because they got very disaffected and disenchanted. 
Um, and the choices of uh, voting options last election really were a, a bad choice to another bad choice. Because on one hand, they were very unhappy with the performance of um, Uhuru Kenyatta and what had happened and the capture of the state. And they knew then, on this other hand, we've got the other half of the um, Uhuru Ruto machinery, right. more state capture. So many Gen Zs and millennials did not vote, did not pick their voters' cards, about a total of maybe 11 million of them in total, even maybe more. But which choices did they have? So I think they have sat there and realized as youth, uh, they are locked out of the economy. Uh, the parts of the economy where they are able to work, mostly informally, are now being subjected to very heavy tax. At the same time, the benefits that were there before, and the benefits Kenyans enjoy are not many, they are not replete, but at least we were having an NHIF that had begun to function. There was help, there were... You know, they're even talking about Linda Mama. We're being withdrawn and everything is being, it's part of this privatization process where you talk about ability to pay, but really what you're saying, it's privatizing. And who do you hit the most? You're going to hit the middle class. You're going to hit the employed. Um, but in actual fact, when you de don't fund adequately, you're going to hit those with the inability to pay. And it's very unconscionable that our legislators, most of whom, if they studied in this country, did so through public money, then turn around and withdraw that opportunity for other Kenyans who will never, whose parents will never be able to pay uh, for that. So our youth, thankfully, decided enough is enough. And what can we say other than I, I congratulate ourselves. I think we did a good job. Parents of our generation did a good job. Because when I saw the way these young people went out onto the street, tribeless, classless, holding each other accountable, solidarity, persistent, courageous, these are national values that we need to embody across the board. The question becomes, how do we, um, how do we ensure that this spring, this this energy, these demands uh, translate into meaningful change. And that is where we are a little bit stuck because our constitution does not anticipate the situation we are in. And my, my uh, you know, conviction is that there is a key that William Ruto holds, which is we'll possibly need a kind of a bill that allows us to deal with this, pro this intermediate process um, because there are things that need to happen. It's not enough just fire the cabinet. Those people who have been fired, some of them have corruption issues that possibly haven't been investigated. In fact, now I'm seeing calls for a lifestyle audit. They need to be taken through that accountability ringer, but then they're not the only ones, and that's not the only list of demands. How do we clean up our politics? Who financed William Ruto's campaigns? Who is benefiting from contracts because of financing those campaigns? What are those conflicts of interest? Because we are hearing even the housing levy right. has con conflicts of interest. Who is benefiting from th the money that's going in to these government schemes? The Gen Z are saying, let us reset. Let us clean it all up. That is a massive task, but I'll encourage you, or we should encourage ourselves. We've done it before. When um, Mwai Kibaki came into office, he found, I mean, he came in from the Moi regime, systems weren't working, and really the economy was a shambles. In fact, our GDP was in the negatives, and he began to institute change. Part of the transformation he made was done by a team in the public service that was called the Public Service Transformation Department. And it was a small department of four people who went into departments and they would map the, the, the um, systems of, the, of these uh, departments, like our licensing, our passports. You know, we've had problems with our passports recently. They had sorted all that. It shows that actually you can institute reforms, right. and when you don't have the right people, you reverse them. So we can encourage ourselves in that we've done it before, but we need a framework. And when it was done, it was done under what was called Rapid Results Initiatives. 
It was very accountable, very transparent. It was not punitive. It was not name calling, but it was accountable and it was effective. So mechanisms exist. It's not about round tables and big merry-go-rounds and right. you know lots of showbiz. Okay. We want to see action. I wanted to help you, um, Ben, to put context. In this new or rather in this constitutional dispensation of ours, the people are sovereign. We, the people of Kenya, sovereignty belongs to us. Right. When the people go to parliament to occupy, it's their house. It's not, they're not breaching. They're not even causing treason. No way. If they go to city in state house, it's their house. True. They have right. only donated and delegated it to the people, the occupants. Yeah. So the issue, and that's why it died, when the president said it was treason and to breach a parliament. No. Parliament is our house. We only send representatives. Otherwise, we should be all sitting there. So that issue the should youth, be looked at. The, the yeah. youth factor, Martin. How, the youth factor. I'm coming to how it. How timely? The, you know, no, there's something that they, that's happening which is important. I, earlier on when we started, I said, it's the youth energy, the youth focus that causes change. This country called Kenya, the fighters, the Mau Mau guys, the, 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 the early liberation fighters were youthful. They were in their 20s. Yes. The kind of leaders we had in the 60s, the Mwai Kibakis, the Kianos, the Matibas, were in their 20s. This is the youth we are talking about. The likes of people who made change in this country were youth. The young trucks, Anyona, Orengo, they were youth. So anybody wishing this youth away misses the point. So that the difference that we are seeing, which may be not also too much of a difference, there's one factor that is happening. Anybody listening to the youth throughout, they spoke from a position of knowledge. They read the financial bill. Most of them read the financial bill perhaps more, th more thoroughly than any single member of parliament, including those who are in that committee. Some of them had not even read it, so they read. And when you listen to them, the analysis was spot on. They were very clear very articulate and so on but they are also speaking from a value base they hate lies they hate hypocrisy they are calling people out on it they are calling religious uh, people out of it they are calling the president out of it they are saying we are tired with your lies and so you have a situation where because the youth are coming with a value they believe in something they are actually speaking and stuck to it. They are tribeless. But they also speak language. They were able to speak to uh, us in Somali, in Kimasai, in Kiluya, in Gidolo. They were able to actually use their language to speak to, their, to people, but still Kenyans. They were rounded up. But more importantly for me, they were speaking of spirituality. Now again, we are not listening to them. They are saying, we are spiritual. Now you can argue what is spirituality. But they are saying, we don't like this religion and these denominations. You are sellouts. You have taken us where we are. This youth movement is well informed, is well educated, is value based, and is spiritual. Ogopa. Kabisa. Kisia, Mr. Kisia. Make way. Yeah. Make way. Not Ogopa. Make, Make way. way yeah. Yeah. So, so they, are, they are brilliant, they are educated, um, but you also get the feeling when you interact with them and you, you, you told us you are father to uh, one or two of them. Um, both uh, generations. Both, both generations. Eh? Yeah. You, you get this feeling that they feel they are not listened to and they don't like that. But what do you make of this? Yeah, I, I think it's true. Um, uh, the, both generations, uh, particularly the Gen Z, um, you know, they have this feeling that they are not being listened to. Uh, both probably, at, uh, in some cases, at family level. It's that's from family. family. In some cases, at family level. Mm -hmm. But worst of all, at government level. That the, the government of the day has not incorporated, you know, their, um, uh, their aspirations. And that's why the frustrations are coming through. So, um, and, and unfortunately, we probably have a government 
that is coming from two generations, from uh, the generations that is agitating for change. Now, you find that um, that particular generation has forgotten that um, the, the people they are dealing with are totally different from the, the, you know, their age groups, the boomers and the silent generation. Okay? So now, when you look at the way they are responding to the turbulence within the social, economic, and political environment, it's quite different. Mm -hmm. The response, the tactics, the strategies they're applying are keg. And they're not fitting, and they're not responding very well. And that's why you're finding that, um, um, you know, when our children went to the streets, they were applying, they are using technology to mobilize. They are not like my sister on Jiro, you know, you have to make phone calls and write letters. You know, they were spontaneous. My, and myself, <laughs> and myself, we are both in the same generation. So, you know, the, the, the strategies that are being applied on, on the youth are very inappropriate. So there's need for us as um, the, the people who are in current leadership to relook at ourselves and ask ourselves, are we really able to manage 70% of a generation that we don't understand? 70% of a generation that we are not listening to and we will not listen to them for a long time. So they have got to a boiling point and they are vetting out the anger that has been bottled for some time. In fact, their ventilation like, you know, uh, goes beyond their, their generation. What they're saying is, we saw our parents going through hardship. We saw our parents being frustrated. You are able to silence our parents. You are not going to silence this particular generation. No. We should, we'll look out. It's something you have to look out for the, where this goes. Finally, before we wind up, um, Wanjiro, moving forward, where does this go? The president um, speaking uh, while making that announcement did say that he will be going into some consultations. You call him the outgoing president. He uh, says he'll be consulting people from various sectors, various political formations, he says, uh, to form what he called a broad-based government. Where does the country move from here? I think even in that statement, he doesn't get it. Um, and one can only hope that now that it's out there and there's going to be responses, that um, he'll get some good advice because this isn't about just setting up a government. I mean, the tasks that have been put down, and, and you know, I'm saying there's a work plan. Uh, dissolve the cabinet is one of the items on the work plan. Um, but even as this is happening, we know that um, there are some abductees who have not been found. There was a young man who was abducted, and we're not quite sure why, I think a couple of days ago. Uh, he hasn't uh, spoken and resolved the issue of those, um, those who were killed. I think dissolving the cabinet um, is beginning to listen, but the president needs to listen holistically, and he needs to understand this is huge. It's about we have an economic system that works for very few. We have an economic system that hasn't made space for our youthful majority. So people are well qualified, well educated. They are not absorbed into the formal economy. When they get into the informal economy, um, it's not stable for them. Uh, because actually our, the way we measure employment really masks the reality that a lot of people, you know, when we're talking about this hustler, and bottom up, what the president had said is that he was going to institute structural change because our system, our economic system isn't working. Our political system is definitely very broken and you can't actually enter it without patronage and bribery and corruption. So this is why I say he's the outgoing <coughs> because I'm not sure William Ruto has yet grasped the fact that it's landed at his time the task to reform the Kenyan state. And this is going to require um, the, Sol the wisdom of Solomon, uh, a lot of courage. It does require good dialogue. Um, and the first step in my mind is for the president to be very clear about his roadmap to transit, to implement these things and to make the transitions that are needed and to recognize that he's possibly not part you know, he's not going to cross it. it's canon, or we can use another term. He may not cross uh, simply because he's, you know, he's tainted by 
a number of things that may not allow him to cross, or he may not even pass the muster. Once these things are implemented, mm -hmm. it may sweep him by the wayside. So we have a, a transformational moment in this country. And it's one that we need because unless we institute it, a majority of our population continues to be on the fringes of our economic, political, and social system. And thank God to, for Gen Z, they brought it up, they brought it up peacefully. And let's just admit, we don't know what to do, but let's call our best resources and recognize that as Kenyans, we're in, uh, we have a lot of ingenuity, we have a lot of past experiences of when things have gone wrong, we've managed to solve them. It's just that now there's a, a indicator-led uh, action plan so that it's measurable. And they put there every two weeks, they want to have a, an X space with the president. Yeah. Every month, they want to be, uh, have a round table. Um, and there are things that aren't on here. So let the president give us a roadmap. It's not ambiguous anymore. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kisia, what is your take on this? I mean, they are, they are what Wanjiro talks about. Then they are the practical things, people asking all these questions. Where does the president get, uh, how does he focus, as he says, he, he, as he makes that next uh, cabinet? Where does he get these clean people? You know, um, let me say this, uh, and, and just like Martin, uh, uh, there's some little hope. Yeah. Uh, we cannot completely give up, uh, because if you give up, then what next? Okay, then you have a vacuum. How do you deal with the vacuum? Mm -hmm. I think if and when Kenyans give President uh, Ruto a, another opportunity to provide leadership, he has the opportunity to select using a, a very transparent uh, a, a method to arrive at a credible and trusted cabinet. You said, where will he get the people? There are thousands of Kenyans who fit the bill. So we are not short of people who can assist the president run his government. He has only refused to appoint the right people. It is within his powers to do so, but he has refused. The other, th and, and, and of course, there are people who merit. The yeah. people he appointed, 70% did not merit to be in those positions. The other thing that um, uh, probably he needs now to stop doing is to weaponize the institutions that are supposed to help in, in govern. We have seen he made promises that uh, he, he is actually now put in the back, back, backer. Uh, things like um, uh, you know, using the anti-corruption to punish people who are perceived to be against him and to reward people using DPP, using the police. Uh, right now we have so many of, of, our, of our youth who cannot not be accounted for. So we should stop weaponizing those particular issues. The other thing is that the president has discretional power powers. He should stop using those powers in a manner that cannot benefit us. For example, if Wanjiru okay, was holding an office and certain things happened, deal with, with Wanjiru, don't spare Wanjiru because Wanjiru comes from your ethnic background. Deal with her. If Philip Kisia is unsuitable to hold any office, public office, for heaven's sake, don't appoint him because you feel comfortable working with him. Okay. Go for Martin, Martin, who may be perceived to be against you, who may not agree with you in many instances, but he can help you govern. Finally, and that is where I, where I agree with my uh, sister, Wanjiru. You know, it has not dawned on the president, my president, because he's still the president until he, res he resigns. We're hoping that he can resign, but what about if he doesn't resign? I am if he resigns, you'll have Gachagua. Yeah, so he'll have Gachagua. So, so be is that a better alternative? That's another question that we must be asking ourselves. I think what needs to dawn on the president is that the employer, the bosses, his bosses, the people of the Republic of Kenya have said no to his leadership. And he must find a very neat and smart way of exiting the stage. All right. Very quickly, Martin, how does the future of this country in terms of politics look like? The young people have been locked out of uh, the economy, as Wanjiru said. They are locked out of the political system. But 
They seem to have forced themselves into the conversation. They seem to have forced us to, to talk about things like uh, Chapter 6 of the Constitution and all that. You know, there was a lot of hope in uh, William Ruto by many young people. Because he's a young person. I mean, he came, he, the man has been in politics since his 20s. And he's been, uh, in, remember when he was uh, giving uh, Ruben Chesira a hard time, he was in his 20s. Hmm. So these young people who are also giving him a hard time are reflecting him in his 20s when he was dealing with people like Chesire. Yeah. So there is a place where he's been running a marathon. He's been running a marathon in Kano. He's come, he's run a marathon in ODM. He's come, he has formed UDM, which he left. He has gone, formed URP, which he merged with the TNA. And then he created Jubilee, which he left, and he's formed UDA. At the time of his crisis, he was on a journey that was terrific in the sense that he was now planning one of the hugest political parties that we ever know. He has been stropped in his tracks. I'm so happy that he hasn't gone uh, on a flight outside Kenya for the last three, four weeks <laughs> because we were used to him either flying or visiting somewhere but not settling down. So basically there is a place which we hope he can now pull back to. Again, like my colleagues are saying, there's a time I told him, and it's Ram Emanuel who said that never waste a crisis because a crisis is a moment for you to rethink, to reboot, and to re engineer. So, is he going to waste this crisis? Is he going to waste the opportunity? They say tragedies offer choices. So, what choice does he want to take from this tragedy? I want to hear him say, and by the way, we haven't, there's more fire coming. I am aware that there is, the Office of Control of Budget is about to release her report for June. There's more fire coming. The Auditor General has said that we cannot account for 15 billion shillings on e-citizen. Total silence. Life is not the same anymore. Questions will be asked, details will be flashed. Earlier on we were saying that some details are too personal. In wars like this, anything counts. So I wouldn't stop at anything uh, in these things because then, you, you know, we don't want to protect anything. No, personal medical records <laughs> are not <laughs> part of no, it. No, no, I haven't talked about it. I haven't used the details. But I'm saying, <laughs> in wars like this, everything goes. You see, we have sent a delegation. You don't pick the language and stack tactics of your wait, oppressor. Wait. The, the, the we have but, just said but, that but Martin has been very guarded, so yeah. I don't know until why, why seen, is he rubbing you the wrong side. We have, we have just seen a team. We have just seen a team go to Paris, <laughs> and we already have details that they're joy riders on that team, yes, and people have already okay. smoked. We already did. We already did. That's good. We are fine. This is the openness that we are going so to do. So Martin, one minute only. Give me your final thoughts. Kenya stands on the precipice. What are what are your final thoughts? We're in a good one place. Minute. We're in a good place. Ready for takeoff. The young people have done by the way i am so happy because some of the things we've been talking about on these shows without action yeah, the youth are talking about it complete with the action organization and effectiveness so cc amchia uh, analysts we have been written off i mean as wanjiro said earlier <laughs> that even civil society uh, has lost work so we are in a good place the young people are showing leadership and let us just trust them they are hopeful and we need to trust them because we believe they know what is good for us. Mr. Kissia, one minute only. Your final thoughts tonight. Well, um, I mean, just to encourage the, the Gen Zs and the millennials that uh, this country belongs to them and they should not stop pushing. They should push. And I am of the view that they should not stop picketing. They should continue until all their demands are met. Thank you. Wanjiro, your final thoughts. Yes, uh, good that the president has set aside this cabinet. He needs to look at the police service, the leadership in the police, the killings. That is not uh, acceptable. The IG, DCI, disappearances, DPP, those are, those are people with uh, credibility questions. There are also some appointments he, he's made outside the country that have really rubbed people the wrong way because people who are not eligible have been put into office. He needs to clean up, drain the swamp completely. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, advocate for good governance and accountability, Wanjiro Kikonyo. Governance and leadership experts, Philip Kisia, as well as lawyer and political and governance analyst, Martin Olo. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight here on NTV to help us make sense of what happened today 
We here on NMG will continue to cover this for you, dig in what happens in this country over the next a few weeks, where this country goes next, in the way only we can. I am Ben Kitili. Good night from Nairobi. <laughs>